Calculus is a set of tools developed to deal with quantities that change. It builds on algebra and geometry. It's based on a pattern that's easy to learn and apply. And using calculus, you can calculate instantaneous velocities of falling objects and find the areas under complicated curves. Calculus can help solve seemingly impossible problems like the one an Italian scientist had in the 1500s. What was Galileo doing dropping objects off the Leaning Tower of Pisa? He was trying to prove falling objects accelerate uniformly. That means they speed up by the same amount every second regardless of their weight. But he couldn't measure acceleration. The accelerometer hadn't been invented yet. Acceleration is the rate of change of the velocity. Could he measure velocity? Well, radar guns hadn't been invented yet. Velocity is the rate of change of position. Could he measure the position of the objects as they fell? No, they fell too quickly. This was before stop-action photography. How did he slow objects down? He rolled balls down an inclined plane. He figured gravity was the only force acting on rolling balls as well as falling objects. So Galileo rolled lots of balls and found a pattern to the distance they rolled. No matter how steep the plane was, the ball rolled four times as far in two seconds as it had in one second. And in three seconds, it rolled nine times as far. Let's put this into a table to see a pattern. We'll do that a lot in this program when we're trying to see patterns in data. You can see the distance is always the square of the time the ball has rolled. d is equal to t squared. The beauty of seeing patterns like this is now Galileo doesn't need to construct a hundred unit long ramp. We can extend the pattern as far as we want. Even in Galileo's time they had equations like d is equal to t squared, but it wouldn't be until the 1600s that Descartes would do something ingenious with them. He mixed geometry and algebra, two fields that were traditionally practiced separately. His secret was grids. In the 1300s, an ancient map of the world was discovered where grid lines were used to indicate equal distances and to indicate they knew the world was round. Artists used grids to develop perspective art. Descartes was the first to graph equations on the grid. Each point on the grid is named for its horizontal distance and vertical distance from the origin at the center. How does this help Galileo measure acceleration? Well, we can plot the distance the ball rolls and find the rate of change from the graph. For that we have to go to a graphing program. I like GeoGebra. You can go to GeoGebra.org and download it for free. But where do you find the rate of change from a graph? Well, let's start with an easy example. We'll graph the distance a car gets under constant velocity. The horizontal axis will be the time in hours and the vertical axis will be the distance in miles. So if we drive at 60 miles per hour, how far do we get in one hour? 60 miles. So we'll graph the point 1, 60. One hour, 60 miles. We have to zoom out in order to see that. there it is. We can also move one of the axes and we can move the whole view. How far do we get in two hours? Two hours, 120 miles. Enter. There's point B. And in three hours, 180 miles. What figure does the graph of constant velocity make? We can connect the dots with a straight line. The other points in between are on the car's path, and the points beyond are points, too, assuming the velocity stays constant. Now, the rate of change of a straight line is constant. Like in our line, the rate of change is the velocity. Here's the equation of a line. We can change that by right-clicking on it and put it into y is equal to mx plus b form. The equation of the line contains the rate of change right before the x. This makes sense. The distance, y, is equal to 60 times the number of hours that we've been driving at 60 miles per hour. The rate of change of this line is 60. In geometry, the rate of change of a line is called its slope. GeoGebra can display the slope of a line for you by using the button in this drop-down. Select the line. 
the slope is 60. The slope is the vertical distance divided by the horizontal distance. You can also make a random line and change its slope dynamically. But if we graph Galileo's problem, we don't get a straight line. Remember the distance was equal to the square of the time it rolled. We'll use x for the time and y for the distance. Actually, we won't put y is equal to. We'll just put x squared and let GeoGebra assign the function a name because that'll be easier for things we want to do in the future. Trust me. y is equal to x squared is not a straight line. It's called a parabola, and GeoGebra can't tell you the slope because it changes. The slope here would be negative. The slope here is zero. The slope here is positive, and so on. What we can do, thanks to modern technology, is zoom in on the curve until it's pretty much a straight line. And then we'll calculate its slope at a point. This is called a linear approximation. We'll graph the point 1, 1, and we'll zoom in on it. So when we're zoomed in this close to the curve, it looks exactly like a straight line. This is called a linear approximation. And you can see that it looks like it goes up to and over 1. In fact, if we make a line on top of this curve like that and ask for its slope, it's 2. Then we zoom out again and see what a good approximation this line is at that point. And that's called a tangent line. It's the linear approximation of a curve at a point. If you zoom in really, really close, that line is a pretty good approximation for what happens on that curve at that point. So just to give you some notation, when we zoom in this close to a curve, the tiny change in y is called dy, the differential of y. And the tiny change in x is called dx, the differential of x. So the slope of the curve is the rise over the run, or dy over dx. Let's hide a few things and look at another point. Point two, four. We'll zoom in. There. Looks like at this point the line goes up four and over one. Well, we'll make a line again. and check its slope. The slope is 4. So we'll find the slope of the curve at one more point and then we'll look for a pattern. We'll stick with whole numbers and look at the point 3, 9. Zoom in. Okay. This one it's not so easy to count the squares, but if we make our approximation line, ask for the slope, it tells us the slope is 6. So in order to see patterns, we put things into tables, and when x was 1, the slope was 2. When x was 2, the slope was 4, and when x was 3, the slope was 6. So do you see the pattern? The slope of the curve, y is equal to x squared, is always twice whatever the x value is. Now in algebraic form, 
dy over dx equals 2x. We can also write it y prime equals 2x. This slope function is called a derivative. That's one of the most important concepts in calculus. So as far as Galileo is concerned, he wasn't using x and y, he was using distance and time. The slope of the distance curve is equal to 2t. The rate of change of distance is the velocity. So the velocity at any point is twice the time that the ball has been rolling. So what about the function y is equal to x cubed? What we'll do this time is attach a tangent line to the curve and we can see the slopes instantly. We'll graph x cubed. Let's change its color. Make it blue. And make it thicker. This is how you attach a tangent line. First you put a point on the curve and that's attached to the curve and you can move it around. Tangent lines are here. Tangents. Select the point or the line then the circle conic or function. Select the point then the curve and there's the tangent line. That's the approximation of the slope of the curve at that point. We can move that point around. So of course at zero, slope is zero. What is it at one? At one, the slope is three. What about at the point two, eight? the point 2, 8, the slope is 12. And at the point 3, 27, the slope is 27. I'm not seeing a simple pattern, so let's put those numbers into a table and play around with them. Now if you don't see a pattern right away, that's okay. Neither did I. I did notice that all the slopes were multiples of 3. So what happens if we divide all the slopes by 3? They become the square of the x value. The slope of the curve y is equal to x cubed is always 3 times the square of the x value. So the slope function of y is equal to x cubed is 3x squared. And all the different ways to write that in math. dy over dx is 3x squared or y prime is 3x squared. Now let's find a pattern to these patterns. Now when the function was x squared, the slope was 2x. When the function was x cubed, the slope was 3x squared. What do you think the slope of the function x to the fourth is going to be? It just follows the pattern. The exponent becomes the coefficient in front of x and the exponent is reduced by 1. So the slope of x to the fifth is 5x to the fourth and so on. Mathematicians do all this exploring algebraically. It's not as much fun, in my opinion, and it leads to philosophical problems for them. Like the fact that the change in x gets so small, it's almost like dividing by zero. This is a no-no in math, and it took a few hundred years after the invention of calculus before mathematicians invented a notation that would make this okay. It's called limits, and we won't be using it much in this program, but just know that it's there. Anyway, this is the most important pattern in calculus, the pattern for differentiating polynomials. In the next module, we'll even run this pattern backwards to solve all kinds of problems. This gives us the ability to find the rate of change of anything just by working with the function for its position. Remember, the rate of change or slope function is called the derivative. The derivative of the position or distance is the velocity. From there, we can find the acceleration by differentiating again. In the examples and exercises, we'll find out how this is used to find instantaneous velocity, local maxima and minima, and points of inflection.